All right. Hey, what's up, Jay? All right, we're going to listen to some music for a few minutes while I let everybody kind of filter in. Sorry for being late. I had some technical glitches, unfortunately. For being such a tech head, I'm an idiot when it comes to technology. Hey, why you guys are in here, give me some digital love because it will help the, um, uh, the, the algorithm, right, so more people will see it. So hearts, some of these, ah, right, smiley faces, likes. All right, enough music. Thank you for the digital love, everybody. Going to let everybody else kind of filter in. Um, all right, so Laura just texted or messaged me. Oh, my God, how do I? Laura, it's in here, although you know you can't see it because you're not on the live yet. Um, but uh, what's up, Tara? Hey, Robbie. Mr. Thomas Tara. Sweet. Everybody's joining in. All right, so hopefully we'll get more people. So keep showing me the, the digital love. Every time I say something awesome, or if I like uh, ask for engagement, just just throw some more on there because the more we get, just the more the more people will see this, and the higher in the algorithm it goes. So, so quick tip for any of you guys who ever do Facebook Lives, uh, that is how it works. Uh, I'm also going to be drinking this during. This is a Monster Energy drink. Very bad for you. All right. So today, this is going to be a bit off the cuff. All right. So. Uh, fortunately, uh, I didn't really plan like a full presentation, but I'm going to show you a lot. All right. So I know I got you in here because the, the sexy Facebook ads, but I'm actually going to be showing you a lot more. Okay. Now also one quick point, uh, to note, Brie is in here. She is my, my, my assistant. She's going to be, uh, you know, if you have any issues, issues with sound, you can't hear me. Uh, you think I'm ugly. Um, now that can't be true, but you know if you have any issues at all, let Bree know because I'll be busy doing my shit up here, and she's monitoring the um, the 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 um, what the hell is it called the uh, comments, right? I'll be kind of monitoring it myself as well. I will answer any questions you guys have. Uh, feel free to ask. Ask away. This may take an hour, may take an hour, fifteen minutes, may take forty-five minutes. Depends on how fast I get through it. So, let's go ahead and begin. All right, so. First off, thank you for being here. Um, shoot. Sorry, somebody's calling me on my thing. They should know not to call me on my thing when I'm on a live call. All right, so, Lori, hope you get on here. If not, you'll, you'll see the replay. Also, I'm going to show, I want to record this, and it'll be sent out a little bit later today or probably tonight. So, here's the thing, right? Uh, I want you to ask you answer this question for me. Um, uh, I know a lot of you guys as either independent recruiters, individual recruiters, or small source from owners, right, uh, are doing the kind of the same old thing all the time, right? It's, it's cold calling emails, kind of the main, main two things. But I know a lot of people are really interested in things like lead magnets, um, Facebook ads. I mean, look, hell, it got you here, right? Uh, how to run Facebook ads for your recruiting business. And unfortunately, uh, for a lot of folks, running a Facebook ad just hasn't worked out. So let me ask you just in the, in the comments, has anybody here run Facebook ads for your recruiting business and the results were pretty shitty and if you have done that please let me know in the comments that would be super awesome what's up leslie anybody feel free to jump on it well i'm gonna let that kind of percolate there i know a lot of people though have placed facebook ads in on facebook for the recruiting business and it's hard um hey what's up james it's hard because for one you can't target effectively Right. So, and by the way, I'm going to give you some examples directly from my own recruiting practice from the, the Kineta Group. Oh, by the way, guys, for, for, for you folks who don't know who I am, you probably should. My name is David Patterson. Obviously, you guys know I'm, I'm a recruiting coach, but I'm also one of the rare recruiters who act recruiting coaches who actually runs a real live recruiting practice. I run the Kineta Group. I specialize in SAP Direct Hire, um, and uh, I work with companies. All over the country. I've been in the SAP space for about uh, you know 15 years. Those who don't know what SAP is, it's IT, but it's very large scale IT. Okay. So the people I market to, the people I want to get in front of, these are these are CIOs, VPs, and directors. So keep that in mind for all you all you you know uh, uh, negative Nellies. You say, well, my face, my, my audience isn't on Facebook, dude. I'm gonna hold the CIOs on Facebook. Okay, they're there. They're there. 
But anyway, I'll get back to that later. So, so I'm going to show you kind of what I do in my own practice as well as uh, what I'm helping some of my clients do within their practices and my own marketing campaign. Okay, so with all that being said, let's start. The first thing I want to talk about is this, guys, and I've got some notes I want to kind of keep referring back to here. Uh, let's see if anybody has responded here. Okay, so here's the thing, right? This right here is the most important device, right? I mean, we're, we're living in, in a world where the internet has changed the world. We have all the world's information right here. Okay, and all the big brands in the world, all the you know the Mercedes and Nikes and and Reeboks and General Mills or what have you, they're all they're spending like eighty to hundred billion dollars a year on commercials. And I don't know about you, but I don't watch commercials. I DVR everything, or I watch Hulu, and I've got Netflix, right? And if I do happen to catch a commercial for whatever odd reason, it's a live sporting event. Guess where I'm at, right? Everybody. Right? I take a crap. I'm right here. I say that I'm, I'm in line at the 7-Eleven by my daughter or Slurpee. I'm right here. And regardless of what you say, regardless of what you say about it ruining society or you're, you're sick of people at dinner time and they're, they're on their phone, I don't care. Right? As, a, as a businessman, right? business doesn't care. I mean, the, the reality doesn't care about your feelings. It is what it is. It's here. It's not coming. It's here. Okay? Everybody's on here. Everybody, uh, whether it be you know Facebook or YouTube or Instagram, but for our purposes, we're going to be talking Facebook and to a lesser extent LinkedIn. Okay, and here's the thing, right? When it comes down to it, attention is the the currency. It is the 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 number one currency out there, because unfortunately, you can't sell me anything at all unless you have my attention, right? And, and attention comes in uh, kind of two two forms, and I'll talk about that in a second. But at the end of the day, unless you have attention, you've got literally nothing, right? So it all comes down to attention. And here is how we used to get attention as recruiters, right? We're cold calling, and that's really all we did. We cold called and we started email blasting, okay? Right, so, but think about from our, our client's perspective. And by the way, I still cold call to this day. Not, not very much, but they still can be effective. But here's the deal. Your clients are getting cold calls all the time. And every recruiter is a specialist. Every recruiter is a veteran in the industry. Every recruiter has a proprietary process. Please look at my website, my proprietary process that sounds exactly the same as everybody else's proprietary process. Okay? So, unfortunately, what most recruiters do is they call, they get a hold of the hiring the, the hiring manager, and they pitch an MPC like a like a marketable candidate, or they or do like more service calls. Hey, I'm a really awesome recruiter. And what happens is it's kind of low hanging fruit. They happen to catch somebody when they happen to have a need. But most of the time, we hear things like there's no needs. Talk to HR. Uh, Got to be in the vendor list. Uh, go through bounty jobs. Ugh, you know, uh, all all that kind of crap, right? Because unfortunately, we're not relevant to them. It's it's at the end of the day, we're telemarketing, right? Think about when you get a telemarketing call, even as for a service that you need, you're not gonna want to be on the phone with that telemarketer because you weren't planning it, you didn't want to talk to them, you regretted picking up the phone, and you're like, I, I can't, I can't talk right now. It's even worse, you know, if you have a door-to-door -door salesman. Uh, trying to trim your trees or fix your roof or do whatever or, or, or say some overpriced carpet spray, right? For 40 bucks. Um, I was the sucker on that one once. Had a hose, really good salesman. But that's that's the reality that, that we live in, right? So we turn to email blasting. And here's the biggest mistake recruiters make email blasting. They take their two or 3,000 contacts they have in their ATS system, right? And they take these people and they dump them into an eight to a, an autoresponder, active campaign, or for a lot of you folks, Mailchimp is kind of like the uh, uh, what, for, what a lot of folks first start out with in the Mailchimp. Here's what happens, and you're like, "Holy shit!" I get all these unsubscribes, and you do get a couple people that say, "Hey, I have a need." But what happens is you get you dump them into an autoresponder where they should have opted in, but they didn't. Nobody opted in. When you get an email that is obviously a marketing or sales email from an autoresponder, what you did not then, are you pissed off? Or are you like, ah, oh, thank God they emailed me. Let me see what they let me, let me see what they can offer me. You don't, you're pissed off. And you usually either block them or you unsubscribe. 
right? Another mistake that happens. So that's kind of where we're at. And unfortunately for a lot of recruiters who want to work at a higher level, higher level for, for my purposes uh, is not going to be like, say, full retain, right? Because I don't, I don't do that. Um, but we're talking either exclusive or even better, engaged, where you, you get paid money down. Where let's say it's a, a senior level position and you, they pay you five or 10,000. If it's a management role, they pay you 10 to 15, like for a director or VP or something like that. And then the balance is due upon hire. Okay. We all, in fact, if you guys, if any of you guys who actually want to, want to work at a higher level, like we're talking higher level search, either getting paid a higher fee, getting paid money down and exclusive. Give me a hell yeah in the comments, please. I want to see that you guys are engaged. If you're not going to be engaged, I'm not going to be as engaged as well. So engage, please. Give me a hell yeah in the comments. So here's the thing, right? Let's, let's talk about why it's hard to pitch higher level search. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to share that with you, share it with you, some core concepts behind everything. And then I'm going to give you the tactical plan behind, okay, how I run my Facebook ads to actually launch a higher level offer to market that's actually an irresistible offer. That's something that they want that they want to pay more money for, right? Hey, what's up, Jay? Hey, what's up, Fred Fox, Rich, Robbie? Uh, so by the way, I've got a couple clients in here. Uh, I've got um, Jay is one of my private clients, so is Fred Fox. So welcome, guys. Uh, Rob is another client of mine. Anyway, so here is the problem. Let me see if any comments here. A lot of hells, yeah, a lot of yeps. What's up, Tim? What's up, Kurt? Bill? Chris? Sweet. Connor? Uh, Connor, you better get on it, man. Doors closing soon. Uh, anyway, so the problem with selling higher level search is this. We're calling in, right? And here's how most recruiters pitch higher level search. And not, I'm not going to be as, as elegant, but in essence is, hey, this is a hot, hot need. I'm a really great recruiter. I'm a specialist. If you really want me on this, these other recruiters aren't doing the job, pay me a little bit up front and I'll go right in on the search, right? That's kind of how we, we pitch it. But think about this, right? Isn't that the same kind of offer as, as what everybody else is offering? There's nothing substantially different. The only difference is you're asking for something up front, right? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Our clients are in pain and they're in drastic pain. Right, and I always complain about this a lot. Uh, recruiters tend to focus on selling to the problem and not the pain. Hey, you've got a position open. I'm a great recruiter. Let me fill it. I can fill it faster, you know. But we're not selling to the pain, right? So the key to having a higher level offer that somebody's going to actually want to part with their hard earned or their company's hard earned cash and put into your account and invest in themselves is to recognize what kind of pain that they're in and to create and craft an offer that's going to solve that pain, an offer that no one else has, right? A unique offer, okay? We're gonna come back to that in a second. So in order for us to actually sell something like that, it's really hard to take them along like that customer journey that they have to go through to kind of to see your, your offer as being relevant to them. When you're on the phone and you say, hey, do you mind? Give me about 30 minutes time. Let me talk to you about my offer and, and why you're in pain and what the real problem is and how my solution really, hello, are you there? Like they're not gonna give you the time of day because we're dealing with a sophisticated audience, right? They're sophisticated in the sense that they've heard the scripts, they've heard the rebuttals, they're like, I, I get it. Yet, yeah, yes, you're a specialist. Yes, you got a great process. Blah blah blah. Hey, uh, can you work on this for twenty percent with the three other recruiters? And you got to compete with HR, right? So, that's unfortunately what we're faced with. And when you look at if we want to increase our billings or or scale beyond you know what we're doing now, right? If you're working contingency, here's the thing. Most recruiters fill about 20% of their contingent job orders. That's a fact. Most of them, a lot of them are even less, okay? Now, if you work exclusive search, you're more like 50, 60% because you're still competing with HR. If you're working on an engaged search money down, you're more like 90, 95%. So it's, it's much, much higher, okay? So it's much better, better for you, but it's also not only better for you, but it's also better for the client because our clients... Again, we'll talk more about pain in a second, about what their true pain is, but think about the, the pain that contingency search causes, okay? I mean, our clients need top performers, right? They need top performers. And when you post, when you take, when you rip a job posting from, from a client's site, 
right? And you go post it to Indeed or Dice or Monster or whatever, and you replace ABC codes looking forward. You, you place with our client is looking for, and you paste that goddamn job description. You're, you're basically just working arbitrage. You're hoping that a candidate applies to that first before they apply to your client's job posting or somebody else's who also copy pasted the same job description, and you're working quick trying to get them in there, right? Because there's an HR timestamp. And you don't have time to really dig in on a search. I mean, is it not in our client's interest, right? If, if they really want to hire top performers, is it not in their interest for us to say, okay, I want to, uh, let's say it's for a director, a director OC, and this is something from my industry, right? I've got a client who is, uh, I've got a, a, a proposal out for a retained right now. They want a director OCM. So I basically look, you can use contingency, which they have been, and they have, they've been getting crap, okay? Or I can go and map the entire market, and I can, I can find every single director OCM in the southeast. This company's in Charlotte. In the southeast, I can map every single one, and I can design a strategy whereby I take your boring-ass job description, and I make it make your employer value proposition like bulletproof. I mean, this is like a no-brainer. I'm going to interview your top three performers, find out what makes them tick, and I'm going to screen for that. In addition, I'm going to take videos from your top performers on why they love working there, why it's awesome, why it's amazing, why they stay there, why, why they, they get up excited on a Monday, Monday morning instead of having to work for the weekend, right? Take those, put that into video montage, and that's going to go to every single candidate. Now, also what I'm going to do, we're going to reach out to every single person through video, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, organic. I'll do goddamn smoke signals, right? We're going to do cold calls. We'll do mailers. We're going to make sure that every single person out there is invited to a five-minute conversation with me or one of my team members to sell them on this amazing opportunity. We're going to use, again, video, chat, text, whatever we have to do to get this in front of them, okay? Not only that, I'm going to make sure that every candidate that comes through, before you see them, we're going to do references. We're going to do a pre-recorded video interview so you can see what their executive presence looks like before you even, even talk to them. Okay. Now when you go in, I want to completely revamp your entire hiring process because your hiring process sucks, right? One out of two hires are mishires. So I want to I'm going to train your you and your staff on how to do scorecarding interviews, uh, uh, behavioral interviews, working interviews, or test drives. You know, we're going to do all those things. In addition, we're going to guarantee them for a year after they start. I'm going to check in at 30 days, 90 days, 180 days, 365 days to make sure they are hitting their performance benchmarks that we set. Right now, if that was a contingency job search, I, I lose money if I did that with every search. If they paid me up front, I could do that. Literally, it is a it, it is a raw deal for our clients. Quite literally, these are it's quick fix solutions. The problem that they think is the problem is, hey, I need another recruiter working on it. No, you don't need another recruiter because they're doing it's just, it's 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 a bad system. It's a bad system, right? They're focused on speed. Heck. Do this with your clients. Ask them if you ever try to, to, um, to sell higher level search. Ask them. Ask them if they, if they find it weird that the recruiters they work with represent the candidate, even though they're the ones paying the bill. It's 100% true. When was the last time your recruiter told you why not to hire a candidate, as opposed to how their candidate is amazing and better than the other recruiter's candidates? Never. Never because they represent the candidate, but you're the one paying the bill. That's messed up, okay? So higher level search is better, but again, our clients are so used to these quick fixes, right? It's like, I'm the doctor. I know you need back surgery, but you're so, you're so pilled up on pain pills, and that's all you want. You just want more pain pills, even though it's causing you more harm than good, okay? Now, if we take a look and don't worry, guys. I'm going to get to the Facebook stuff here in a second. I just want to share the, the, the foundation, okay? Now, in addition, if we look at the concept of pain, I talk about pain a lot. Um, you know, when we are selling higher level search, right, we want to be able to somehow speak to the pain that they're in. Now, I'm going to take a breath after that big rant, and I want to ask you guys, do me a favor. If you guys can tell me, give me ideas in the comments below, please, what sort of pain do you solve for your clients, or what pain are, you, are your clients in? I love to hear some ideas. As soon as I get a couple uh, comments, I'll tell you what my thoughts are on that. So, while you do that, I'm gonna go take a quick drink of my Monster Energy drink and recharge. Mm. 
Mm. Excuse me. All right. Anybody got any uh, pain ideas? Come on, guys. Give me a little something, something. What's up, Jim? Hey, Eric. Love the service aspect. Sounds like it's cool. Mediocre candidates. Thanks, Jay. All right. Uh, anybody else feel uh, – there we go. Waste time whenever your resume they shouldn't be reviewing. Okay. That's good pain, right? Well, that's good pain. Reducing the risk of hire. Tim, that's a good one. Clients of ours using startups who have never hire speed and get in the can client. Can yeah, so I mean, all those are good pains, right? Now, he, but here you want to talk about like pain, current personnel not firing all cylinders. Trey, that's actually a good one. That's pretty close. So, all right, so here's here's basically thanks, Fred, Rob. All right, so here here's the the deal when it comes to pain, right? All that's good. All that's good, and a lot of that has to do with using um, inferior recruiting solutions. Can, classic contingency search, right? Where we're just throwing shit against the wall. We're, we're flesh peddlers. But here's the thing. Here's a real pain that they're in, right? If it's a, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a sale, if a director of sales for the Southeast territory, I don't know, right? Their pain is walking into their boss's office to explain why they missed plan for the third quarter in a row because of a poor, because of a poorly performing team. That they can't seem to motivate. And he's worried about maybe walking out of there not having a job. And he can't go two months without get without another paycheck because he's mortgaged to the gills, and he's got three car payments. He's got to pay for Johnny's college, and he's busy working weekends. He has to call in again on a Friday night and miss dinner with his with his kids. Hey, honey, tell the kids I'm sorry. And he's stressed out. He's overweight because he can't work out. He's so stressed with raised cortisol level. I mean, that's that's pain, and that's pain related to the lack of talent, right? Now, this is a study, and I use this in my my marketing sales all the time. So, guys, write this down. This is this is really really important. Uh, leadership IQ. I'm gonna write this down so you guys can take notes. Leadership IQ did a study. All right, uh, they studied 5,214 managers, uh, 312 organizations with 20 thousand hires right this was a three-year study so this is a real study all right I don't know if you guys can see that my handwriting is atrocious so they found that over an 18 month period of these 20,000 hires 46 percent were failures right that's a flip of the coin. Now, when we talk about hiring people that are better than you, and it's a cliche for a reason because it's true. The number one, if you're, if you're a rocket ship, right? If you're, if you're being promoted, 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 you're a rocket, but you need rocket fuel. And as soon as you hire a, an underperforming team and you can't seem to get good talent, right? If you're faced with that, what's it going to do to your career? You're a lead, then you're promoted. No, you're an analyst, then you became a lead, then you became a manager, then you became a senior manager and a director. So you're feeling great, but you're on, on the fast track, and then er, it stops, right? And you're frustrated, and you're, you're, it's a Herculean effort just to keep the team afloat. And then Bobby leaves, and now you got to worry about, is Carl going to leave too? Because Bobby's friends with Carl. Bobby told Carl he's getting a 20% raise. Now Carl might want to put his resume together. Fuck, what am I going to do? Like, I, I can't. I don't have the time to hire anybody, Okay. And on top of that, our managers, our clients have never been trained how to do this. You go to any business, like any library in a, in a bookstore, right? You see all these books on leadership and motivation and, and all these business books. And how many books do you find in recruiting top talent? Like a couple. But that is the biggest determinant of, of, of our client's success and or failure. But here's, all, here's some other numbers, right? That's even more telling. 46%. Were failures. Nineteen percent were considered a success, and this is in an eighteen-month period. Okay, nineteen percent were considered this guy was worked out. It was a good hire, success. Now here's reading between the lines. Right, I mean thirty-five percent. Eh, they're not failures, not successes. Eh, but you know. 
they're not bad enough to be fire, but if I had to go back in time, if I had a DeLorean and I went 88 miles an hour and Doc Brown's DeLorean went back in time, I would probably warn my younger self to maybe think twice about hiring this individual. Maybe go with the other candidate. Like they're not that bad, but they're not good enough to be rehired. Those are your classic C players, right? So basically, right, if you look at my current my post I did on LinkedIn today, right, to, to my SAP audience, I talked about in 18 months, half of your SAP hires are gonna be mishires. And of the ones that are left, there's better the average chance they're gonna be C players. That should shake you to your core. Right, that is the pain our clients are in, and when what we do or what HR does or whoever, right? We post job descriptions, and what we do, what happens? We get active candidates who respond because they're active for a reason. Maybe it's legit, but a lot of times they're underperforming at their current job, and they need to get out, or they've been fired, or what have you. You know, no judgments. I'm just saying, right? For an active candidate, the odds are you're likely not an A player. You might be. But usually the A players are heads down, getting paid really well, and their employers are working hard to keep them. So it takes some effort to get them out, right? But we, we don't have time because we're, we're busy. We got a 20% chance on this one, 20% chance on this one, 20% chance on this one. You know what's even worse? When you call in you call on a cold call and get a contingency job order on these search that's been active for a couple of months and you got four of the recruiters on it, NHR, your odds are 20%. They're like 5% because all the market's been picked clean. Right, so your odds are even even less. So we're not really doing the clients any favors with this, but they are so addicted to this because it's easy to get another recruiter working on it. You see, we're we're like cockroaches, right? We're everywhere. That is the issue. So, so let's talk about how we can make ourselves more relevant to the market and actually create a higher level offer that makes sense to our clients. And then, of course, how to use Facebook and LinkedIn and email to get that out to market, okay? Oh, excuse me, drop my, drop my markers. Uh, redefine talent, what do we all understand? Sweet. Oh, yeah, the source of the data, yeah, so that's leadership IQ. So, that's the, client, that's the pain our clients are in, guys. We need to sell it, we, we can't be afraid, because you know what, guys? At the end of the day, what we're in is we're in the business of, of transformation. We're not in the business of placing talent. We're in the business of transforming our clients' lives, their personal, their family, their health, everything through the proper application of talent. When you look at it in that lens, it becomes a lot easier to, to create an offer that's going to be relevant to them. Okay. Now, another key concept before I get into the actual nuts and bolts of the Facebook and the LinkedIn and all that kind of jazz is the art and the science of becoming a master craftsman at the in the or I'm sorry, becoming a master craftsman in the art of talent acquisition or the art and science of talent acquisition okay um i've uh, ranted on this now for the past few months about us being half steppers in the industry but how we say we're so great at getting talent and we all say it but really beyond just the getting of the candidate right and selling it what about when they go in do we do we know as recruiters how to help our clients put together a scorecarding system? Are we going to trust that they know how to interview when they obviously don't because of their, their abysmal hiring record? Okay, they don't know how to do it, but we're going to trust them to do it. Okay, and yes, we say we prep our clients, but most of us don't. And when we do, it's off like an old MRI script, and it, all we're doing is we're just letting the client know what the candidate's hot buttons are, and okay, make sure don't talk salary. Then we don't. That's it. That's kind of the extent of our client uh, uh, education, right? But. If you're asking your average recruiter, hey, all right, so should your client use a scorecard? Because scorecards are really key when you're interviewing top talent, right? Oh, you don't have a scorecard. Great. Well, let me tell you why you need one. And here's, here's some best practices on how to put one together, right? And, and to get your entire team on board, right? And once you do that, here's how to design a competency interview so you can use that score scorecard so you can, you can assess everybody like evenly, right? And on top of that, now once you do that, here's how to do behavioral interviews to make sure that blah, 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 blah. All right. And now just because somebody interviews well doesn't mean that that's the person that shows up. Here's how to create a, what we call a working interview for your environment. So for me, for example, I can tell my clients that, hey, if you have an analyst or a big architect position, right, give them a business problem and sit them in front of a computer on a sandbox environment in SAP so they're not 
you know, screwing up the system, they make a mistake and, and set them loose for about four hours. Let them call the business users, see what their communication skills are at. Do they call a meeting, right? Let your business users know somebody might be calling and then take a look at the creative problem solving process. How do they creatively work through the problem? And then technically within the system, are they doing the right drop downs? Or do they, do they actually, they said they're an expert in this. Now let's put the proof in the pudding, right? Or the proof is in the pudding, right? So I can help my clients design that. Right, and then what about retention? Do do we train our candidates on how to onboard themselves effectively? And do we train our cl clients on how to onboard effectively? And what about retention strategies? Right, all those things are really important, and we have no idea how to do them. So, so the very first thing I have my clients, my my recruiting clients do is become a great, become a master in the art and science of talent acquisition, right? Because that's really what we offer to our client. That's a real value that we can have. That's, it gets them away from that, that 46%. So we can find the best talent in the world. If they can't secure that talent or they can't, they can hire them, they can't keep that talent, they can't retain them, then, you know, th th we, we didn't do them any favors, right? We just made a quick placement. So that's my thought on, on becoming a master craftsman in the art of talent acquisition, all right? Now, let's talk about how we can roll something like this out. So what we wanna do is we want to have some sort of higher level offer. Let me, if there's any quick questions here. Sonia Hastings. Oh yeah, she had a question. If the job is picked over by five contingency firms, should you take on as Engage. So I'm gonna get into the rest of it just really quick. So I want to move on to the rest, but I'll answer more later. But I will say yes. You can certainly take it on as engaged because those contingent recruiters probably haven't. They probably picked apart like the 15% of the marketplace. It's just that if you're going to take it on as contingency like everybody else, unless you're willing to do something different than they've done, then I probably wouldn't take on the search, right? How how often have you taken on a search and you did a contingency and so you did the same thing everybody else did and you hear. Oh, oh, somebody were to call me about that. Oh, yeah, I interviewed like a month ago. I never heard back, right? Another problem contingency, by the way, on a side note, they're poisoning the well for all their future searches. Because what do contingency, okay, what do contingency recruiters do when the candidate says, I'm not interested in the candidate, or when the client says, I'm not interested in the candidate? Average contingency recruiters, not you, but the average ones that are, that are, that are shitty, okay, they don't call the candidate back. So candidates know, well, if I didn't get a call back, I guess I'm not, I'm not selected. Right? Then they go to write a bad review on Glassdoor, which everybody looks at, or they tell their buddy, and then that buddy tells another buddy, and that company is developing a reputation for, right? And on top of that, you have five contingent recruiters all with different stories, you know, and the candidate says, yeah, I, I, is this ABC Co? Because I, I thought I heard from another recruiter, but it sounds different. Is that the same role? Are you sure? Right? So they're poisoning the well for all future searches. Talent is fairly finite. Maybe you have 200 available candidates who would fit the bill for future searches and more and more and more are getting word that this company may not be a great company to work for. Another reason why lower level search is not in our client's best interests, okay? So back to this, all right? Attention. So we want, if we want to sell something like this, we first have to have our client's attention. And attention comes in the form of this, all right? People who say that, look, my audience isn't on Facebook. Facebook doesn't work, okay? Mark Zuckerberg is in front of Congress because they're, they're afraid that Facebook has the power to influence elections. And we say our clients don't look at this, right? This can't sell our services. This has been used to sell like blenders and iPhone cases, yes. But to get the attention of our clients, it is an amazing tool because we're dealing with a very finite audience, right? For me, I might market my services to 3,000 decision makers in the whole the entire country, right? That's my market, okay? And so for folks who say that they're not on there, they're really using a focus group of one because their grandma's not on there or their uncle's not on there or they're emotionally just pissed off about what Facebook is doing to the youth and my kid has no social skills because he's online with his million friends. Yes, he has social skills, by the way, because he has a million friends online, right? It's just a different social game, all right? So they assume that doesn't work, yet they've never placed a Facebook ad, right? Again, it's, just, it's, it's the height of naivete, right? So I want to talk to you about how you can not only develop a higher level offer and how you can market that via Facebook and their social media channels to get in front of your clients. And then I'll show you, kind of share with you what I'm doing with in my own uh, current campaign. Okay. 
if that works. All right, so first off, we need attention, right? Attention basically comes in two forms. If we want attention, we need to be relevant. Okay? We need to be relevant to our clients, and we also need to be top of mind. You, want, you can call it omnipresence. Call it top of mind, whatever. Just always being there. Okay? And you need both because what happens is if attention is the new currency, right? And, and by the way, when it comes to attention, you have all these like Mercedes and Nikes, Reeboks. And like I said, they're all spending their money on commercials that no one watches. They're going to figure out eventually that this is the conduit, right? That we're always on here. And when they do that in a few years, our advertising costs are going to go through the roof. So this is kind of the time where I'm buying up all the real estate that I can to buy Mindshare with my clients so that when they think SAP recruitment, they cannot help but think of David Patterson. Because the more you see something over and over, the more it becomes real in their head. It's the mere exposure effect. There was a study done, and I don't have the exact numbers, but basically they took these kids and they took McDonald's french fries and they gave them a set of McDonald's french fries in a McDonald's container and same french fries in a non-McDonald's container. Almost to a child, they chose the McDonald's container. Same French fry. I, I, in fact, I think if even if you put crappy French fries in the McDonald's container, they still would choose that because that mere exposure effect, right? They have the attention of the youth. They're omnipresent and they're relevant. You know why they're relevant? Because kids care about fun. Kids care about cool little toys in the, in the thing, right? Kids care about Ronald McDonald, I, I suppose. So to them, it's relevant, right? So here's the thing, right? When we are not, when we're relevant, we are super good at what we do, yet we're not omnipresent. We are the world's best kept secret, and that doesn't pay the mortgage and it doesn't do your clients any good. Okay, we're omnipresent, we're everywhere, but we don't have a relevant message. We become the Ty Lopez of recruiting, right? We're a mosquito. We're like buzzing everywhere, and we're annoying. So you have to have both omnipresence and relevancy. So I'm gonna talk about rel rel bleh. I'm gonna talk about relevancy first. And what that means and how you build it through through developing uh, an offer that makes sense and developing your messaging. And then we'll talk about how you can use Facebook um, and LinkedIn and email to lesser extent to build that omnipresence. Okay. So that makes sense. I hope it does. Let me check if I have any additional comments here. I'm good. Sweet. How can a recruiter not cost someone back. How do you believe that happens? Oh, it happens all the time. Jenna, just just look, just do a Google search. Recruiter not calling me back. Heck, do a do a Google now go to LinkedIn and in quotes put in do not contact in, in the search bar. And you'll pull up probably about 10,000 or so profiles that have some sort of hey guys, I'm back. Sorry about that. My feed cut for whatever reason. So I'm back. Uh, I'm going to give it a few minutes to let everybody else filter back in. So, unfortunately, I apologize. Uh, let me uh, text Bree and let her post in the group. All right, you guys are back. What's up, James, Deborah, Jay? All right, guys, sorry about that. We're back on. All right, people are starting to filter back in here. I lost a lot of viewers, shit. So digital love, everybody, because it basically boosts the algorithm. So please smash that heart button or like or smash the don't like button, whatever. I don't care. Just smash something. Oops. Okay, 
All right, we got some people back here, so I'm going to go and move on. Everybody else can just catch this in the replay. Again, apologize, guys. So, Bria, like I said, if you can hang out in the Facebook uh, news feed and just let everybody know that I'm back to being live again. All right, so let's talk about relevancy. How, how do we create something that is relevant to our clients? All right? Can you guys see that? I've got this. Turn this light off here. See that? Nah, it makes me really dark, though. All right, we'll just deal with it. So, if you guys can see that, it says relevancy. We have avatar, methodology, offer, messaging, okay? So everybody wants to get to the Facebook ads right off the bat, right? Because it's, it's the shiny shit, and I get that. But the reason why you placed a Facebook ad and didn't work because you didn't do this, right? Because you weren't relevant. So you got to figure out your, how to be relevant to your clients. So the very first thing you have to do, you have to figure out who your clients are, right? Now, not just what your industry is, like what your function, industry, location, level, what your fill niche is. I'm talking about your actual, um, uh, like the language they use, right? Do, do your clients have, it, like do they, are they afraid to go in their boss office explain why they didn't hit plan third quarter in a row? Do they work nights? Do they work weekends? Are, are, are they not able to go home for dinner because they're on the production floor having to deal with this shit, right? Uh, are, they, are they about to lose funding because they can't hire the right talent? Whatever it is, we have to figure out what language they're using because that's how we get their attention. That's how we get their attention, okay? So imagine if, if I'm a weight loss coach and, I, and my perfect client is, over, uh, is a middle-aged man who is overweight, right? Still, eat, you know, still works out, so relatively active. He's got like an extra 50 to 75 pounds, all right? Now, let's say I'm an expert. I know, I know for a fact it's not the working out. Like he thinks it's maybe I should do CrossFit, maybe Orange Theory, maybe it's, 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 it's Jiu Jitsu. I got a buddy does that. Maybe I'll try that. Maybe on low T, I'll try the cream. Maybe I'll go to uh, a new trainer. I, I, I need a new supplement. That's not the real reason why you're overweight. I know because those are all quick fix solutions. I know it's because of your relationship with food. Okay. But unfortunately, you don't care about what I have to offer because my solution is harder, it's longer. It's effective, but it's not as sexy as buying Bowflex for 900 bucks on a late night infomercial while you're stuffing your face with yoo-hoos, right? So in order for me to get their attention, I have to speak to the pain, and I have to speak to the pain that they feel, right? Not, and being overweight is not a pain, right? Their pain is, is being at the pool party, and they're finding every excuse in the book and not to take their shirt off because they're embarrassed. And their buddy Steve took his shirt off, at the poor party, he was, a, he was the first to take it off and jump in because he's got abs and he's an asshole. And you saw your wife look at him, but you know you're not worried, but she doesn't look at you the same way. And you're always finding excuses to make sure that she's not around when you have to take a shower because you're embarrassed about your body. You used to be a sexy beast, and now you don't have, you're not virile. You don't have energy. There's no sex life at all. And you feel like a fat piece of shit. And your new belt size, you're looking in the mirror at, at yourself right now, your new belt size is your new normal. Right, and three months ago, you looked at your belt. New normal was like a belt smaller or a notch smaller, and three months ago, a notch smaller. And you're afraid it's going to happen again and again and again. That is pain. I've got to speak to that in that person's language, right? Visually, so you got to figure out what is your what are your clients' pains, and it's different for every industry. A lot of there's a lot of crossover. A lot of it's the same, but a lot of it's very unique. Right, so you got to figure that out. Now you also have to figure out. Let me look at time here. You also have to figure out your methodology. How are you going to go out and get that talent? Well, that comes to be. It comes down to being a master craftsman in what you do. So we're we're going to uh, kind of slide past that. I've already covered it. Next is your offer. That is how you deliver this methodology. Right, your offer isn't your methodology, and I'll explain that in a second. We, I'm going to we're going to come back to this. Right, your offer has to be like a new vehicle, right? Here's the thing, when it comes to, when it comes to um, people paying more money for something or, work, or doing something that, like some sort of higher level service or anything, right, that involves transformation, people don't want the same vehicle, right? When we try to sell higher level search, but we're making it sound like the exact same shit that they're getting with the other recruiters, in essence, what they're trying to do is they're, our client is trying to go from from point A to point B, okay, which is a long and difficult road, and they've got this busted up Corolla, 
I can't draw cars very well. They got this busted up Corolla, and we're saying, hey, you know what? I've got another busted up Corolla, but it's green. How about you buy that one? That might get you there, right? That's what we're selling. We're selling the same old vehicle that they've lost faith in. I don't want to sell them like a brand new vehicle. I'm going to sell them a, I don't know, I'm going to sell them a Ferrari. Is that a, is that a Ferrari? Uh, that might be a Ferrari. I want to sell them a Ferrari. I want to get them the hell out to be quick. I want to bring a brand new Ferrari. And I want to sell them why this vehicle sucks. It's never going to work out. You, you might get lucky. You might find the right person. But you're not, it's, you're very, you're, you're, you're not going to get from point A to point B very well. Okay. I need to sell them something that is unique that no one else has that is a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or whatever it is you want to call it. I want to sell them that. I want to make it irresistible, okay? So let me show you an example of what I've done. So this is my off. This is something I work, work with my clients through. Um, and same thing I've done here. So I am – my goal in the SAP market is to completely dominate my space. I'm going to own the SAP market. I'm going to be the base of the Ferrari, Right in SAP recruiting. So if anybody here is an SAP recruiter, please leave the live. Thank you, much appreciated. Actually, it doesn't even matter because I'm going to have an offer that you can't even you can't even touch. So let's look at my methodology. Right, my methodology. Right, I'm going to tell you exactly what my methodology is. I've got to print it out here. Right, my methodology is when they use my services. Right, my methodology. Step one, my discovery session. Right, we work with you to create an EVP that is basically a no-brainer for top uh, performers. We collect EVP videos from all your top performers, and we interview your top performers to make sure we to, to find us to make sure that we know what makes them tick, and we screen for that. And we also develop mutually an end-to-end -end messaging strategy designed to attract passive candidates. Okay, we also do a market map, and I'm going to kind of breeze through this. Right, we also do a market map. We literally map the entire market. Okay, and we're also going to give them the information when we're done with the search. We'll talk about that in the actual offer. Set so three, our, our, our candidate maximizer, our engagement maximizer. Right, we, we use a multi-pronged engagement strategy, LinkedIn emails, LinkedIn emails, LinkedIn ads, Facebook ads, cold calls, messaging strategies, email, autoresponder emails, smoke signals. We'll do direct mail. Heck, if it's a really difficult search, we'll send a $10 gift card for, for the charity of their choice and say, let me buy five minutes of your time so I can talk to you about my amazing client. I will spend an afternoon recording 112, because there's 112 candidates in the market. I'll record 112 60-second personalized videos on my iPhone about, hey, how amazing this opportunity is. I'm going to have my assistant upload this to YouTube, get all the links. And we're sending those out in texts and emails, right? Because we want to make sure we're getting on there. We're getting their we're getting their attention, right? So that's a huge, huge, huge piece of my my methodology. Uh, step four: we have a performance filter. We we assess on seven different performance standards, and we do executive summaries, pre submitted references, and there's video pre recorded video interviews. Step five: bulletproof interview. We work with you and your team to make sure that you bulletproof your entire interview process. You can de-risk the hire. So that forty six percent is not going to happen. Okay. Step step six. I'm sorry. Step. Um, there we go. Step six. Red zone. Sorry, I lost my track. Step zone, step six, the red zone, okay? When you got your one or two picked, then we do working interviews to make sure the person who interviewed is the same person that shows up. We do backdoor reference checks. Like we'll do a social media review. We look at their publishing history, right? See if there's anything anything we need to be, be thinking about or looking at or any red flags. And of course, step seven, my, my retention regimen. We're gonna make sure not only we're gonna guarantee them for a year, but at 30 days, 90 days, 180 days, and if one full year, we're going to do informal reference checks to make or informal checks with the manager and the candidate to make sure they are meeting or exceeding the performance milestones that we set all the way back in step one in a discovery session. Okay, that's my methodology. All right now, secondly, is my offer. I got to make it irresistible because not only do they get that methodology, they also get a full market map. Okay, flesh that market map. So I'm gonna give them the data after the search is done. They can take that data where all the top performers are residing. Okay, um, we're gonna do a complete revamp of your employer value proposition. So next time you have to recruit somebody and you can't use a recruiter on it, you know how to sell it. 
right? We're going to make sure that you have a three-month full passive pipeline talent uh, um, PR system. Basically, we're going to be PR for your firm. So for the next three months, if you have another hire, they're already pre-sold on you. They want to work for you because they've heard so many great things. We're going to manage that, which is a great lead into my continuity program. After three months, if you want to continue, there might be a small retainer every month for that. Right, um, I'm going to kind of breeze through this where you get can confidential candidate briefs, access to our proprietary video interview system. Uh, here's one you get full access to our corner office interview training suite. Right, this is a training program for the, their management team on how they can completely bulletproof their interview system. This isn't a five minute prep with the client, like, hey, all right, make sure you talk about the hot buttons and make sure you're selling, right? We're talking a full three, three hour video suite so they can take them and their team, they can train on something that they've never done before, and they can actually provide a bullet, they can design a bulletproof interview system for themselves, okay? Full training. We also provide full access to our onboarding training suite, both you and the candidate. That candidate gets an hour long onboarding training video to show them what they can do to onboard effectively how to build relationships, how to hit the ground running, how to manage expectations, all right? Same thing on the, on the client side, right? You get full onboarding and retention training in addition to a one-year guarantee, in addition to all those check-ins to make sure they're hitting their performance milestones. I mean, God, that is a hell of an offer, right? I'm just saying, that's a big one. So that is how you create a higher-level offer. Trying to figure out what all the pains that your clients are going through. I don't know how to interview. Miss hires me using my gut. Okay, we'll complete a full, uh, full interview training system for you. Boom, we'll give you that. All right. Um, you know, you, you don't have a place to go for Thanksgiving. Great, you get to come to my house for Thanksgiving dinner. We'll give you that. Right. Obviously, I'm joking, but fear what all their pains are. I had a recruiter a couple months ago, and he used an ATS system where um, he was telling me that their his clients can go and log in and check all the uh, the candidate activity, and they will look at the notes and all that kind of stuff. And that sounds like a really cool feature. So I asked him, well, how many people use it? He's like, zero. Because going in and checking is a pain in the ass. And unless they're solving a pain, they don't care. right? To quote uh, one of my mentors, Jesse Elder, he's the guy that even gave the concept of the lighthouse method. right? Jesse Elder said that no one gives a flying fuck about your shiny shit. Right? That office is full of shiny shit. But it's because I'm responding to pains that they have, right? So this it's key for whenever you create an offer, make sure it's relevant to them, relevant to their pain. All right. Next, talk about messaging. Now, messaging comes down to I want to create some more space here, and then we'll go into the ads. All right. Messaging. Let's use a different color. Let's use purple. Uh, messaging comes down to this, right? In order to be relevant, you've got to sell what we call a problem. All right. Can you guys see that? You gotta sell them a problem, right? If they don't recognize the problem, right, and, and, and the problem is in the wrong vehicle, okay? If they don't recognize the problem, then no matter how much I talk process, they don't care, okay? So I got to sell them on the problem first, and then I can sell them on the process, right? And also within process are things like my, my authority, my knowledge of the industry, uh, you know, my value bombs. Hey, here's how to conduct an interview. Here's my seven interview tips, right? All that kind of jazz. Now, once I sell them on the process, I can sell them on the solution. Or in other words, it relates to the offer, my methodology and my offer, okay? I got to sell them on that. So first, I got to sell them on the problem and why mishires or such are affecting their career. And if they keep going down the same path, they're going to continue to get the same result. Okay? I get to sell them on the process, not my methodology necessarily. I mean, kind of. But I need to sell them on, on, on the, just the concept of scorecarding, on the concept of working interviews, on the concept of all these things they don't know about and we don't know about either. I got to sell them on how, how this is going to make them more effective. And then I can say, okay, well, I've got a solution. You can do this yourself, and good luck. Good luck. But I've got a solution that could do it better, faster, more efficiently, and get you the results you want. This is the Ferrari. This is the new vehicle, right? Now, there's actually nine whole steps in the, in the, in the journey, 
right? This is just a really rough outline, but this gives you an idea to you sell that, you can't sell that, and you can't sell that in order, okay? In order. And think about when I sell to you, like the recruiters, right? I talk about up here, I guess you can say pain, right? I'm talking about, oops, words are hard, I can't spell. Pain, right? About the, the income roller coaster, and your client's not respecting you, um, or the fact that you feel like a highly paid telemarketer, right? Or the fact that, or here's, here's one, are you doing great, doing great, and then you have a, a month or two months or three months, and you're, you're in a slump, and your wife looks at you and say, honey, you might need to get a job. And you're like, no, I believe I can do it. And she's like, yeah, but we got, we got a mortgage, right? That's stress, right? Once I talk to you about that, I can say, look, you don't, you've got a, a lead problem. The problem is in the fact that you don't have the right script, you don't make enough calls. The entire, the entire thing is wrong, right? You got to fix fundamentally your offer and how you relate to your clients and your distribution and getting your awareness and using Facebook ads. Believe me, this, this is the right, right way to go, go about it. And here's, here's some process. Here's how you can play some Facebook ads. Here's how you can kind of create an offer. Here's a Facebook Live that I'm doing right now showing you the process. And then I say, hey, here's my solution, the seven-figure head under accelerator. I can I can walk your hand I can walk you right through the process, right? And get you up and running and get your higher level higher level offer launched within 90 days or less. Right? You can do it yourself, but let me help you. It's the same concept. If you notice when I when I market to you guys, it's the exact same process I used to market to my clients. Exact same process. And you can use the exact same process to market to your candidates. If you're in a really candidate-centric market, uh, which most of the time I believe that if, if most recruiters say they are, aren't really, okay, because the better the client, the better the candidate typically. But if you're in a really candidate-centric market, you need the exact same thing on the candidate side. It's all the same. Same concept. This is this is this has been true since the dawn of capitalism thousands of years ago in the market square. Okay, so now once you have all of that, that's your messaging, where we figure out what messaging is going to resonate at each stage, right? Do we talk about the pain? Do we talk about the problem? Now that we do our value bombs, right? When you do your seven interview steps and, and the only people who like it and comment on it are your grandma and your other recruiter friends is because you never talk to this problem and the pain. You just talk to process and everybody's talking there. Everybody is, Right. You're not grabbing any, any, any of their attention. When I say, look, that candidate that you thought walked on water that came in and accepted the offer then on the spot, and you were so excited they're going to start, and you told every other candidate, look, I've already got my guy. He's, per he's perfect. You're, you're gonna, he's going to make you look golden. And then he starts, and you're like, and after a few weeks, you realize, wait a minute, he looks like the same guy, but that's not the who I interviewed. He interviewed great. Where'd that guy go? Right? That's, that's a painful situation. Now I can say, hey, look, I've been there, and I've talked about my authority. I've been there. I've been in your shoes. I'm going to show you my one technique that's going to make sure that to ensure, to guarantee the person you interview is a person that shows up the first day on the job. When their butt hits the seat, it's the same person. I'm going to help you de-risk your hire. Let me show you. And then I explain my value, right, my, my, my value bomb, as it were. That is going to get a lot more traction than if I just say, uh, let me show you uh, how to do a working interview, how to how to better how to better assess a candidate to make sure that blah blah blah. Right? I gotta speak. To, I gotta use human psychology. Right? We can be right. We can be we we can be like, look, we I don't want to you know talk to clients about this and that. But if we're not using human psychology to help them, then we're not helping them. Right? And we're not helping ourselves. So anyway, let's move on. Let's get to the actual ads because that is going to be the interesting part that you guys want to hear about okay all right so when you look at a funnel and then we'll talk about the ads this is going along sorry guys when you look at a funnel right classic sales funnel right this is what you have this is called uh, top of funnel middle of funnel bottom of funnel also there's tofu mofu and bofu don't ask, <laughs> but that, that's what that is basically, okay? Typically, for most internet marketers or even salespeople, they say, look, this is, this is attraction. You're attracting, attract, okay? Here, you're engaging, oops. 
and then here you're converting okay and obviously the numbers get smaller the further down you go right think about the meshing we talked about pain and problem we're illuminating pain and problem we're not solving crap we're just illuminating it for them okay now let's talk about process our, our methodology how you can make your life better okay and then for those who are interested hey let's talk about my solution and how that can help right so whenever you look at, at your your advertising right that's ultimately going to do the heavy lifting of selling for you right because at, at the end you're going to have your your offer okay or your your cash money in the pocket right at the end of the day you want to lead them to this irresistible offer this new vehicle that is literally a ferrari that is going to rock them to wherever they want to go okay and up here there you have the avatar right that is in a state of pain uh, i can't spell all right so again this is pain and problem process and solution right so when we look at doing our advertising right i want to sh i want to if, if i want to launch a high level offer once i do all the foundational work first okay now i want to use facebook uh what i typically do okay because facebook, facebook is great for this Facebook is great for um, dripping out content on people's news feeds, right? And in a place where no other recruiters are at, because recruiters right now are all on LinkedIn. They're like cockroaches. You know, they're, recruiters are the biggest demographic on LinkedIn, so what does that tell you, okay? All over the place, so super busy, right? Yes, it's a business platform, but they're all on there. In my market, there's no other SAP recruiter that's placing ads. Okay. By the way, uh, when I, I tell you what ads I'm running, feel free to go to uh, my Facebook page, not my coaching page, right? But my Facebook SAP page is just uh, Google or just uh, in the Facebook uh, 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 search bar, put in the SAP recruiter. All right. And you'll pull mine up. On the left hand side, you'll see in the bottom, it'll say, it'll say um, uh, info and ads. Click that. Okay. No bullshit. You can click that and keep scrolling down. And you'll see all the ads I'm running to my SAP market. Okay. Right now, uh, over the past, say, two and a half weeks, I have gotten in front of uh, close to 2,200 decision makers. Many of you saw my, my screenshot that I posted yesterday or maybe the day before where I showed my, my, my reach. Okay. I've shown about maybe 20,000 impressions to about 2,200 SAP decision makers. Directors, VPs, CIOs, okay, of companies who run SAP. Now, what I do is I drip my content out. I don't. So what I do when I when I want to launch, I have you can call it. I guess you can call it the uh, like a blast, right? It's like an omni blast, all right, or top of mind blast, right? I'm blast. I'm taking out all my existing content from my lead magnet and from all the other articles that I do, and I write these little articles or videos. There's no CTA. I'm not trying to sell them anything. I'm not trying to get them to book a call. I just want to show up in their lives consistently with valuable content and speak to their pain. Maybe show them a little bit of value, but just more, more pain. And just do that over, over a three or four week period. Okay. Right now on Facebook, you can get um, impression, you can get ad costs at about $15 to $25, depends on your market, $15 to $25 per 1,000 impressions. Right. You can spend, you know, thousands on an industry magazine advertisement that four people will look at or and then they're not going to read or i can pay 25 bucks or, or sometimes even 50, 10 or 15 bucks you could be as low as that to get on the news feeds uh, and for those people who say old people aren't looking at their shit on news feeds let me ask you young people old people oh that looks interesting Martha, come check out this article. Hmm, I never considered that. Anyway, moving on. That's old people. That's our market. Okay, they're on there, and they and they consume content way more than young people do. Okay, so anyway, I want to run an Omni Presence Blast. So if you look at my Facebook page right now, I'm running. You can count them. I'm running 24 ads. Okay, and each ad. I, let's say I have it on like a three-week campaign. I'm only going to show an ad to uh, one ad to one person, and that's it. What causes ad fatigue is if I'm always asking, hey, book a call, book a call, book a call, book a call, right? On my Facebook ads manager, 
All right? If you ever played Facebook ads, you have campaign level, ad set level, and ad level. On my ad set level, okay, I can literally say, hey, in this audience of, of, of decision makers, show this one particular ad only once in a 21-day period. And let's say you have 21 to 24 ads. Each of them have that, that, that default, okay? Now, on a three-week period, once somebody scrolls past an ad, they're never going to see it again. It's always fresh content. Think about when someone opts into your newsletter or you get any lead magnet, right? What happens is you get an email sequence. An email sequence is designed to indoctrinate your audience. Unfortunately, they'll never read it. In fact, they'll never read the lead magnet either. So think about this. You can indoctrinate your audience with a Facebook ad campaign, right? It's like a drip, but they're all seeing it. And even if they don't read it, it's that context. They're seeing David, David Patterson, the SAP recruiter, almost daily, okay? And the cool thing is, because it's, it's valuable content, or at least I'm not asking for anything, it's, it's not spammy. Now, if every recruiter did it, then yes, it'd be spammy. I'm, the only, I'm, I'm there in between the Nike ad and the Reebok ad and the ad for Zales Jewelry, and that's basically it, and I'm the SAP recruiter, right? That's, that's what I do, right? Now, for a lot of you folks, like, well, how do I find the people? Because targeting on Facebook's difficult. No one, I, I, no one at, you know, uh, indicates on Facebook of what their title is, right? No one says, I'm a CIO on Facebook. They do on LinkedIn. So I'm not getting into the here, but you can map your market. You can use, you know, I, I was a big proponent of Duck Soup. Use Duck Soup, right? It'll pull down all those personal email addresses of those of these people on your lists on Duck Soup and get your LinkedIn connection emails. And then go send that to a $6 an hour VA overseas and have them go and get the work email, right? So then you have your 3,000 contacts, you got all their personal emails, and then you get all their work emails, and then you take the, that personal email list, you upload that to Facebook, now you get a very defined audience. If you upload 3,000, you'll probably get about 2,000 match, right? It's not one for one. And those work emails, once you actually launch your offer, that's your market, that's your email campaign, right? So how, you, so how you get email into it. Upload the personal to Facebook, and then email them the work, okay? Now, once I do this, this, this blast, okay, now I'm going to release my, and this blast really talks to, to pain, okay? I'm going to release my lead magnet. Now, I was hoping to be able to share that on screen, but the uh, tool that I was, the reason I was late to begin with, I had issues with the tool that I used to be able to share a screen, so I wasn't able to do that. But uh, I'll post a couple screenshots. I've got about an 80 page, and you're, you heard that right, 80 page lead magnet that basically shows them this process, right? How to do how to do um, competency interviews, how to do a scorecarding system, how to design a five-star candidate experience, okay? From first look to first day, first look being the first voicemail they get uh, about the position, all the way to the when their butt hits the seat on the first day. How to design a five-star candidate experience so they don't poison the well for future searches, right? How to do back to reference checks, how to do retention, uh, how to properly onboard, right? I talk about the three C's of onboarding, uh, clarity, connectedness, and confidence, right? It, it's it's most lead managers people download are shitty. They're lame, they're big font, you know, there's there's big margins, it's m m mostly fluff. I want the lead man where I'm I'm dropping the mic, right? So when I release my lead magnet, the ones who download it, and when they download it, they're going to be like, holy shit, this is like amazing. That's going to show me that they recognize the pain that they're in. In fact, let me, that's going to show me that they recognize the pain that they're in. Okay. So this is the pain and the problem. That shows intent. Now, again, this Omni Blast is turned off now because I was just seeding the market, okay? Now on Facebook, I can say, okay, anybody that's downloaded this, this here, or this lead magnet, now show them all that Omni content that really talked about pain, but now switch it over to more process-oriented, more value stuff, more about my authority, my personal story, right? Still show some pain in there, but now they're in process-seeking mode. So show, let's show them process-seeking stuff, maybe testimonials. Some proof that what, what we have actually works, okay? Now, so that's, that's my first, this is the lead magnet that gets them over to this, that, that lets me know that they're in this stage, okay? Now, how do I know if they're ready to convert? They book a call, right? They can book a call with me. I'm gonna go on the phone with them. I know they're in solution stage. Ideally, they, they've already been sold along the way, okay? 
So I can talk, so I can then talk about my offer and share them another PDF, let's say, or, or some document with my offer, right? And all the things are going to get with it, the training suite and the onboarding training, and all these other things for really the same cost of what it would cost you to pay a contingency fee. You're going to pay the fee anyway, right? And that shows me these people are ready to talk solution. What I don't want to do is take my solution, take my, hey, guys, I'm the best recruiter. Use my services and, and market that to these people who don't care. There's going to be a couple in here. It's like, hey, I'm ready to buy, right? That's the idea behind cold calling and mass emailing. But unfortunately, they're not relevant to most of those people. I want to be relevant by talking pain. And then once you buy into that, then I want to be relevant by talking process, and methodology, and my authority, and some, and some proof, some testimonials. Once you buy into that, show those people, hey, come book a call. Let's talk about it. Let me, let me help you with your recruiting. Let me, with, is there a gap? Can I help you develop a scorecard system? Get on the phone with me. No, I won't even, you won't even press you for your search. All right. But by the time you're out the phone with me, you're going to be dying to say, hey, well, let me, can we talk about this? Can you help me do this? Because I'm tired of the last 10 hires I've made, half of them are gone two years later, and the ones that are still here are kind of crappy, right? That's the idea behind your marketing. Now, Facebook is great for all this, right? For those of you who want, who want to, like, well, how do I use LinkedIn or email or cold calls? Well, kind of the same thing. When you release your lead magnet, Right, this is where LinkedIn works really great because you can actually run a LinkedIn ad to your lead manager, to that same audience that you've been you've been prepping over Facebook over and over and over again. Okay, Link, LinkedIn is really bad at like this omnipresence kind of stuff. It's very you can't drip out the content like kind of Facebook. That's the problem. And LinkedIn is so busy with recruiters. Even if you did, they probably wouldn't notice very much. So I use LinkedIn mainly for like a lead generation tool. Right? I'll, I'll run my LinkedIn ad about my lead magnet. I'll also run another LinkedIn ad about, let's say, like, like the book call, all these stuff like that. And I will use LinkedIn organic. So a lot of these ads here I'm running here for a three-week period posts it every day on LinkedIn to let your organic audience see that still, right? So you can use a multi-channel platform. That's where you use LinkedIn. Same with email. Let's say I want to email, right? I can send you know an email out to the same email addresses, the same contact, just their work email. Send an email about my lead magnet. And once, once they download it, now I know I'm going to show them this content. Once they book a call, show them this content. Right? Same thing. Cold calls. Exact same. When I download it, let's say, let's say I who download it, right? I'm going to call them. I don't want to call everybody in my market because, again, I'm going to be a, 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 a annoying mosquito. Although, if they see my stuff over time, when I cold call, they'll probably like, oh, yeah, hey, David, I, I've seen your stuff. I, I get this all the time now. Right, I get VPs and directors and CEOs that reach out and hey, I love your videos. Hey, I love the energy. Right, they, it, they get that 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 name recognition value. Okay, but if you're going to be cold calling, use a service like Phone Burner, which basically drops voicemail, so you can just get on live calls uh, and do that to people who've downloaded your thing. They've indicated some sort of need. Right, that is how, my friends, that is how you run an ad campaign to launch a higher level offer out to market. There you go. Uh, now, <laughs> what time is it? One twenty-one. So I've got about five more minutes. I have a a coaching call with a client in at one thirty my time. Um, so if you guys um, are interested, I want to share with you how you can work with me directly because uh, it's a bit of a um, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. oh so. Yeah, so it looks like Sean Ruder asked, pay for impressions or clicks, which is better. Uh, all right, so I pay for impressions. So on Facebook, paying for impressions is the default. Okay, On LinkedIn, they try to get you to pay for clicks. I always pay for impressions because um, what happens is uh, your ad costs will rise significantly, right? At least from, from my personal experience, you'll pay double, triple, quadruple the money for pay for click. And pay for impressions. If your copy is good, and pay for impressions where you want to go. If your copy sucks, or if you're if you're not if you're not relevant, then pay for clicks where you want to go. Because what what they'll do is they'll they'll only show those people that are I tend to click a lot. But for me, right, I've got a very defined. I've got like three thousand, two thousand, whatever people I want to market to. I don't care about who clicks more and who doesn't. I want to make sure everybody sees my shit. Right, so I always pay for impressions, uh, both on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and uh, cool. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share this with you. Here's my Black Friday special, guys.